Lecture 12 covers um, specific energy. And let's get her going up here. All right, excellent. So we're going to cover specific energy in lecture 12. And the, the things that I'm going to talk about during this lecture are the food number. That's very important. Specific energy concept called critical depth, and then classification of flow along the lines of subcritical versus supercritical. First of all is the definition of the Froude number. The Froude number is the ratio of the inertial forces to gravity, uh, to gravity forces, and specifically we've got the mean velocity of the flow divided by the uh, celerity, well, I'm sorry, we won't get too far ahead of ourselves, divided by the square root of g times the hydraulic depth. This is the hydraulic depth, and you will recall that the hydraulic depth D is equal to area divided by the top width, and we state that here. Now, when we talk about this, we're going to talk about um, this in a little more context later, but if I take a pebble and throw it into a pool of quiescent water, this will emanate a set of waves and they will emanate out, their velocity will be equal to the square root of g times the hydraulic depth. Let's uh, write that a little bit in that. Okay. Velocity is square root of g times hydraulic depth. Okay, I don't know why that just keeps doing that. All right, so that's a definition. We're going to do a lot more with the fruit number uh, in uh, a little later on. If I look at the total energy head, or the total energy, I've got the potential energy due to elevation of the bed, we've got the depth component, and then we've got the kinetic energy component. We can define something called specific energy if we just isolate these components here of the depth and the kinetic energy. And so we call that specific energy E, specific energy. And uh, if we use continuity, we can further refine that and say that the specific energy is equal to the depth plus the velocity head. And here we're expressing it instead of v squared, we're using q squared over a squared. And again, we've got this term alpha, which is our uh, Coriolis coefficient that allows us to continue using the mean velocity uh, to represent the kinetic energy. We'll talk a little bit about, more about that in another lecture. So if I have a particular set of, uh, well, not set, but if I have a particular channel and I have a particular flow rate through that channel, if I just start assuming the depths at various locations, I can compute the specific energy that would correspond to that depth at that channel geometry. So if I had some Q value here, and just for grins, we'll just say that it's 4,000 cubic feet per second. I could assume a various, a, a, a very uh, large number of different depths, and I can calculate something called the specific energy curve. And so if you notice here, this curve for this particular depth, so depth is plotted on the y-axis, specific energy is plotted on the x-axis. And so you'll notice that for every point except for this point down here, which is the critical flow state, has two values of depth that satisfy one value of specific energy. So if I'm in a particular specific energy here, you'll notice that I have two different values of depth that satisfy that. This is called a specific energy curve, and we can do that. So for an example here, you can see that I've got a channel that's a square or rectangular, 10 feet wide. I have a flow rate of 100 cubic feet per second, and I use an alpha value of 1.0. If I've got the uh, specific energy, which is E, and this equation is equal to Y plus uh, alpha Q squared over 2G times the area squared, and I go ahead and, and substitute in for that B times Y as my area, I can uh, put things in, the acceleration of gravity is 32.2, so that becomes y plus 
1.55 over y squared. And so for various values of y, I can calculate specific energy. So I plug in in the table a bunch of values of y, and I use this equation right here to calculate what the value specific energy, and then I plot them. As I mentioned, this is what the curve would look like. It's called a specific energy curve. And so uh, for each value of specific energy, except for the critical state, this C is the critical state of flow, I've got two different depths that correspond to one particular value of uh, specific energy. And I call those the alternate depths. So, th so this is a definition that you should be familiar with. All right, so if we realize that C is equal to the specific, uh, I'm sorry, the minimum specific energy, and it's also a critical state of flow, we're gonna, we're gonna demarcate uh, along these uh, lines using specific energy uh, curve. We've got this area up here, which we're gonna call the subcritical flow range, and this area down here, the supercritical flow range. And you'll note here, if you're paying attention, we're, we know that we've got Q is equal to AB. The smaller the depth, that means the smaller the area for the same flow rate, the, the, when the, so when the area goes down, the velocity has to go, go up. And so in these areas here, where we've got supercritical flow range with small depths, the velocities are much higher than they would be in the subcritical range. This C is corresponding to the critical state of flow. And that critical state of flow is known as the critical depth, y sub c. So when the depth is greater than that critical depth, y sub c, the velocity is less than the critical velocity, v sub c. And that's the subcritical flow range. When the depth is less than the critical depth, the velocity is greater than the critical velocity. And that is known as supercritical flow. Now, uh, if I want to take a second here and, and uh, think about uh, the critical state of flow, that's defined as the state of flow at which the specific energy is a minimum for a given discharge. Again, this, uh, this curve here, the specific energy curve, is a particular uh, channel geometry and a particular discharge value. And so if we look at that, we know that the specific energy is this equation here. And if I differentiate that with respect to y, and that's what I get out here. So I take the differential of the specific energy with respect to y, and I start doing that uh, differentiations. And I come up with this is my form of the differential of specific energy with respect to y. Now you notice we know values of q, and we know the a, and we can calculate that based on depth. But this, uh, this uh, sense of getting the derivative of the area with respect to y. Now, what is a, a, a derivative or dA here? All that is from calculus, you can think of those as just little rectangles. And so if this area right here is dA, then this is the dy, uh, then this, uh, whatever this value is here, if we had uh, this value times dy, that would equal the dA. Now, uh, we, make a, um, we make an assumption here that in, in this, we can say that dA is equal to the top width, T, times dy. Now, we know that as we get farther down near the bed, that that's not a good assumption. But a lot of channels are wide, and we can get away with it. So we can substitute if we got dA, dA, is equal to T dy, then we can rearrange and say that T is equal to dA dy, which is what we have here. We substitute that in, and this equation becomes that the derivative of E with respect to Y is equal to 1 minus alpha Q squared over G A Q T. All right? So remember that the hydraulic depth is area over top width, and so we can further uh, look at this and come up with a value here of the A over T. So that's what this becomes. Remember that the fruit number is defined as the velocity over the square root of, of GD, where this is the hydraulic depth. If this is 
my equation that I come up with for the derivative of specific energy with respect to the depth, this is nothing more than the hydraulic depth. And then uh, if we remember that fruit number is equal to V over square root of GD, well, then the fruit number squared is equal to V squared over GD, right? And so then we can say, well, this right here is nothing more than one minus the fruit number squared. So as we continue to look and we look at this differential, remember what the differential is. If we um, had, let's just throw in here real quickly. If I've got, this is Y and this is X and I have some function that looked like this. At these areas where I get a, uh, a, a minimum and a maximum, what is the dy dx at this location and this location is equal to zero, right? That's, uh, that's uh, the, the, by definition, those are minimum and maximums. If I look at the derivative of e with respect to y, and I set that equal to zero, which the de dy would be zero at the uh, location where I've got the critical state of flow right here. This is de dy is equal to zero. Uh, I can say that that's uh, equal to zero. And if I recall back where I've got that, we pull this down, this DE dy is nothing more than the one minus the fruit number squared. Um, and I can say as well, before, before we get to that point, let's, let's look at this one real quickly here. Um, if, I, I, if I leave this hole and pop this down in here, uh, I can rearrange this and say that the velocity head at the critical state of flow is equal to one half the critical depth. Now this is going to be an important thing to remember because as you work some of these problems later on, I'm going to work an example problem. This is going to come in handy, really shortcut and help us with the problem. Just remembering this. Let's just uh, keep this one in mind because we might need to use it later. So uh, I, I'm starting to get ahead of myself there a little bit. But when we set that DE dy equal to zero, that's uh, zero equals one minus the fruit number squared. And uh, when we get that fruit number squared is equal to one, so that means the fruit number is equal to one. This is what? This is at the critical state of flow. And we have critical depth. That means at this critical state of flow, the fruit number is equal to one. And that's what I'm just saying right here. Okay. And uh, that means that the velocity at that critical state is exactly equal to the square root of GDC. Now remember what I said earlier, that if you throw a pebble into a, a, a pond or, or you know, a lake of quiescent water, and you get emanations out of that, that emanates out at a velocity equal to the square root of G hydraulic depth, V. And so when we look at that, uh, if I, I state that I've got moving water, let's see if I can go to the next one. Um, if I've got moving water and I throw a pebble in there, if it's moving downstream and the velocity of the flow is less than the critical velocity, we can see actually upstream some of those patterns can emanate at least for a little bit. You know, it becomes elongated. This is dropping in a pebble there. But you can actually from the, you can see uh, translation of that impact of the drop in the pebble upstream in the subcritical flow situation, right? Because the velocity of the ambient stream is less than the critical velocity, the V sub C. So it has a chance to fill, fill that uh, upstream. So if, on the other hand, we had this, so this is the subcritical. Let's say that I had supercritical, where the velocity now of the stream is greater than the critical velocity, or supercritical. And so then when I throw a pebble in, there's no way, the water's going too fast. Any kind of disturbance would be just basically going downstream. So this would be the supercritical. And there's no way that you're going to feel the impact of this pebble uh, uh, on the upstream. So there's, you know, that the uh, greater than VC, the velocity of slightly wave would not propagate upstream. So we, we use that all the time. When we have subcritical flow, 
that means anything we do downstream has the potential to affect this upstream. So if I've got subcritical flow and uh, I do something, maybe uh, a beaver builds a dam in the creek or whatever, uh, I would feel that impact upstream. But if I've got supercritical flow, uh, the downstream has no impact on me because you can't feel that propagation. You can't feel that disturbance that's induced downstream on the upstream end of things. So if we look at things, uh, we talk about the critical depth. Uh, one of the things that we want to remember is that the fruit number is equal to one at the critical state of flow. And so what I always do, uh, uh, I look at uh, how do I calculate critical depth? In lecture 10, we calculated normal depth. And remember, that was from the Manning equation. In uh, this lecture, we're learning how to calculate the critical depth. That's going to come from the Froude number. And that Froude number is equal to 1, which equals to V over the square root of G times hydraulic depth. And we'll go through a whole process of, of calculating the critical depth. Now, if I've got a rectangular channel, we can do that fairly easily because we can assume that the hydraulic depth, D, is simply equal to area over the top width, which for a rectangular channel simply becomes the depth. Why? And so uh, it becomes pretty critical or pretty easily uh, calculated uh, for this value of the uh, critical depth. Now, um, I want to go back here real quick. Uh, Make sure I haven't missed anything here. Um, so we got this uh, little Q. That's the unit flow. So I want to mention this really quick. Unit discharge, unit flow. Uh, if I've got big Q, that's the uh, discharge for a particular flow, uh, channel. If I use little Q, that's the cubic feet per second of the flow per foot of uh, width. So that's what we're talking here. So when we talk about little q, we're talking about the velocity times the depth only. We don't put the width con uh, concept in there. So that's what we're talking about here. Um, and you can see that critical depth is only dependent on the flow rate and the, the channel geometry. All right. Um, <clears throat> so really quickly, if we look at the minimum flow situation, or the minimum specific energy, that's the critical state of flow. And in that critical state of flow, if we look at the uh, specific energy equation, we've got the depth plus the velocity head. Well, if it's the critical state of flow, we've got the critical flow depth, we've got the critical velocity there. And as we, we said before, uh, if we know that the critical velocity uh, VC, so let's look at this. Fruit number is equal to 1 is equal to VC over the square root of G DC. So we know at the critical state that VC is equal to the square root of G DC. So I just plug this in to here and I end up coming up with, uh, let's just expand this, E minimum is equal to DC plus uh, uh, alpha times uh, VC squared, which is basically going to be square root of G DC squared over 2G. Well, things start to, the, the, the radical gets uh, removed and I end up getting DC plus um, alpha uh, G DC over 2G. If we assume that alpha is equal to one, we end up getting DC plus uh, DC over two because the uh, acceleration of gravity is. And that's what we're talking about here. So at the minimum, so now it becomes three halves dc. At the minimum state of flow, we can also know that the uh, specific energy at that minimum is equal to three halves the specific, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the critical depth. Now, uh, if we've, we've been talking about uh, prismatic channels up to this point, uh, it's been in terms of uh, what specific energy discussion has been 
in terms of prismatic. Uh, when we consider non-prismatic channels, uh, we can learn the concepts we learned about specific energy to guide us in understanding. So the specific energy diagram is built on sort of a pr prismatic channel concept, but let's think about that in the terms of if I've got a non-prismatic or a non-uniform flow, what, what we could expect. So if we write out our energy equation, and we've got um, uniform flow, so that means the depth at one location is equal to depth at the next location. The velocity head at one location is equal to the velocity head. So all we're left with is the, the elevation of the bed change and the head loss and the divide by the distance. You've all seen this. This is the S of F is equal to S of O. This is for the uniform flow condition. And when we think about that, let's let those uh, pass over. Uh, we are consuming energy uh, in, in a uniform flow situation. We're consuming energy with head loss that exactly equals the drop in bed elevation. So we're nice in equilibrium. I mean, we're in an equilibrium state here because at uniform flow, we're consuming energy at the same rate we're losing bed elevation. So let's think about that for a second. So if I'm in that uniform flow situation and I'm up here in the subcritical flow range, and if I'm at uniform flow, my specific energy doesn't change. I don't go up or I don't go down, okay? I just stay the same, I stay at the same location. Or if I was in the subcritical range, supercritical range, same thing. So when we look at this, uh, what happens when now we go from a uniform state of flow to a non-uniform where the velocity is going to change as we move downstream or we move upstream or wherever. And so we have to look at what, what we would think would happen. So let's say that we're here at the subcritical range and we're at one location uh, on our channel and we move downstream and the velocity starts to increase. Let's just say that we, we're going over a, a, you know, a break in the slope and maybe the slope is going to increase. So we're starting to, to uh, increase our uh, velocity as we move downstream. Well, now we're uh, actually going faster than we would expect to be. And so you can think of this like rubbing your hands together. The faster you rub those hands together, the more uh, friction you have, the more uh, heat you generate, and that's energy loss to the system, and so, uh, or to the flow, if you think of it in the fluid mechanics standpoint. So if the fluid is moving faster than it should at equilibrium, we're actually losing energy faster, and that loss of energy is reflected in the loss of specific energy. So I would move, if I'm in that subcritical range, I move down the specific energy diagram this way. And so if my depth at one location was here and I'm moving downstream and I'm actually going faster than the equilibrium condition, I've got the depth has got to be lower in the subcritical flow range. Now, let's think of it, so that was if the, if the water starts going faster than it would at equilibrium. So like it's going over a ripple or or maybe over a, you know, a little Niagara Falls. You know, as you approach the falls, the water speeds up. Now, let's say that you uh, got an opposite issue. Let's say that uh, you're in a stream and a beaver builds a dam, and so he kind of dams the water up. In that situation, the flow starts to slow down uh, compared to what it would be at equilibrium. So now we're not consuming energy as fast as we would in an equilibrium condition. If that's the case, then we end up having more specific energy. We don't create energy, but we can have more specific energy and we would go up the specific energy diagram. And there, if Y1 was here at the start, we go downstream as we approach the beaver dam, we actually get higher in depth. And it makes sense on our specific energy diagram. <clears throat> so let's look at it from the standpoint of if you put a bump on a bed as you progress downstream. So same idea here. If you put that bump in the bed, as you increase downstream, the velocity is going to increase as it goes over that bump because it's got to constrict, you know, you're changing the cross-sectional area, so it's now going to go faster to get through the same amount of or a lesser space. So you can see as we, we look at that, we got the bump here, all right, so here's our bump. Now as we're starting up here and we're going downstream, as it pu pushes, it goes through this bump, we're, we're constricting the space that the water has to flow through, so it's going to have to increase its velocity, and so I would expect it to lose specific energy as it does so. 
And so if I had to pick, I would think it's going to decrease its depth based on the specific energy diagram. And that's exactly what happens. And you look at that and you can see as you get through there and, and you can go out to a stream and, and see like a, a maybe a boulder setting there or a large rock and you look at the water will actually decrease if it's subcritical flow that is, it will decrease as it approaches the rock. Now, uh, if we look at things, let's just look at this uh, uh, going over a drop here and you can see that the water is, I've already kind of given you this, this um, scenario, but you can see as it approaches the, the precipice here, it's going to speed up. That means as it goes here, it's going to lose specific energy. So we're going to go down toward the minimum and we're going to hit this minimum specific, or we're going to hit the minimum specific energy area right before the brink. Actually, we, we've done you know studies and stuff and you'll know that right at the brink, the depth is actually less than the critical depth. And so we're approaching this critical state of flow right here. And that's what you, you end up having and how it corresponds to the specific energy diagram. All right, so let's uh, talk really quickly here about hydraulic jumps and hydraulic drops. And so you get changes from subcritical to supercritical and vice versa occurs in open channels. So, you know, if you've got a channel going down and all of a sudden then you get a, um, you get a steeper channel. And so we get these hydraulic drops where you end up having, you know, basically this kind of situation where we go from maybe this is subcritical flow up here. So this is a subcritical flow and that means the depth is greater than the critical depth. Here we end up getting uh, critical depth computed here and then we have, it goes through something called um, supercritical, or I mean, sorry, it goes through the critical depth, but it becomes supercritical in its nature as you move down stream. And so here, the depth is less than the critical depth. And so this is a regime change from being in the uh, subcritical flow range. Let's erase this real quick. So we're, we're going from the subcritical flow range just all over the place here. Subcritical flow range to the supercritical flow range. And that's what we're talking about in this hydraulic drop. All right, so this is what we've got. The next slide shows that. You go from subcritical to supercritical. That's a, an abrupt change in the channel slope of the cross section or, or, you know, and so you end up getting this uh, change in the water surface uh, elevations and you go through this critical depth that where the, the break in slope occurs. And at this point here, this is your, when you get the minimum specific energy, okay? Now, uh, this is kind of where we're at with a, you know, a hydraulic drop. This is an extreme case as you go over a precipice. Uh, same kind of thing, you've seen this before. We get the minimum specific energy, and this is the critical depth location at that, that particular uh, point in the flow. Um, this is just kind of an aside here that we find that the brink is actually, uh, the depth of the brink is about uh, the critical depth divided by 1.4. That's, that's basically a kind of a rule of thumb. And this critical depth occurs about three to four times, uh, a distance three to four times upstream, uh, three to four times the critical depth upstream from the brink. So that means that this location of critical depth is about three times the critical depth in terms of the length. L is equal to that. That's what we're talking about there. A hydraulic jump, that's the opposite. So uh, where a hydraulic drop goes from subcritical to supercritical, a hydraulic jump happens when we go from supercritical to subcritical. And so we get this situation where, uh, let's just say that uh, I had this big sluice gate here. So I had a bunch of water piled up in here and I, I'm on this, slope that's fairly flat and but water's coming out underneath this sluice gate really fast and it's coming out um, if it's less than the critical depth it's coming out as a supercritical flow again we're you know basically if i get the specific energy diagram this is the supercritical side here's my critical depth y i'm talking about my depth being down in here somewhere so that's a supercritical flow and that means that the fruit number for this thing is greater than one in this supercritical range, okay? And the fruit number is less than one if it's subcritical. So this is supercritical. 
This is subcritical. And so now we're going out here and we, we're on this flat slope and it just can't maintain a supercritical flow condition on a subcritical or a slope that's really flat. And so it goes through a hydraulic jump. And so uh, this hydraulic jump is the only way you can go from supercritical to subcritical. We had a smooth transition from subcritical to super, but now when we're going from super to sub, it can't go through that smooth transition. It has a very violent jump and uh, goes up and, and, and has, uh, you know, basically uh, reestablishes it up later downstream in a subcritical flow. All right, um, we're going to talk a little bit about examples here in the lecture. I just want to uh, talk to you really quickly about hydraulic jumps uh, when we have these large dams. So think of uh, Bagnell Dam on Lake of the Ozarks. And if you've ever been there, they have these large uh, spillways and water comes down this thing really fast. And so the water is behind it in the dam. And so it, it, it's released over these spillway and it comes down here and this is a super critical flow. And so you get downstream, you get it, this is on the Osage River. So it's fairly flat and it gets down here and it has to go through a hydraulic jump in order to come back up into the subcritical flow range. Well, these are, there's a lot of turbulence uh, surrounding these hydraulic jumps. So they want to keep those hydraulic jumps on a concrete structure because if it was just out in the middle of the channel, it would scour out a great big hole. And so if you ever see these areas below these large dams, usually what they've got is they have baffle blocks that are energy dissipators, and they're there simply to break up this hydraulic jump, cause drag forces to, to basically control the position of the hydraulic jump. Where it occurs, they'll build a concrete apron downstream of these dams, and they want that hydraulic jump to occur down in here and not down in this area where you've got the natural channel because they don't want to have this big scowl. So if you ever go uh, out west or any of the places where you've got large dams and they're not releasing water and you see concrete blocks, large blocks, you know, five by five by 10 or something like that, you know, something really large, that's what they're for. They're, they're there to induce extra drag and control the position of the hydraulic jump. 